Tell us, as a, as a man who was so many years the head of a stock exchange, now you're going to a hedge fund, and you're charged with building up business in Japan and China. In some ways, people could say it sounds like a tough time, right? Japan's slowing down. There's a trade war for China, et cetera, et cetera. And you might also say, no, that's that gives it opportunities. How are you taking this on? And when you look at China, what are the what, what are the big factors for you there? Well, our business already has a significant presence in Asia. We invest globally. Uh, I know there is um, uh, some concern about global slowdown, uh, what's happening to the, the, the curve, for example, flattening, um, concerns about slowdown in China. Uh, but if one looks into greater detail, there is indeed some slowdown in, in some manufacturing areas. Uh, but we do see continued expansion, for example, in services. Uh, and I think the opportunity in Japan today, particularly for the, the major Japanese investors, uh, given the particular configuration of the curve in Japan, uh, is to expand their uh, investments overseas to take advantage of growth opportunities. And this is an area where I think we're particularly well positioned to, uh, to be of assistance. So, Xavier, given that you were in London for so many years, and given that the concerns about a slowdown in Europe have ratcheted up again, you know about the, the German Purchasing Managers Index on Friday, you know, getting going from weak to much weaker. Uh, That's true. Global yeah. bond rally, et cetera. Is Europe, quite apart from Brexit and the risk it poses to both sides of that, that deal, uh, is, is Europe in real trouble now, do you think? Well, you know, we've had some concerns, uh, certainly for some time, uh, as relates to growth in Europe. Uh, but those concerns also um, offer opportunities. Uh, for example, we think the retail sector, where we've been very active uh, from a, a distress perspective, uh, presents a very, very significant opportunities uh, for, for investors. Um, the truth is, if one looks at uh, global GDP, if one looks at, uh, at growth in, in AUM, this is not where growth is. Uh, the United States and uh, China today represent uh, close to 50% of nominal GDP on a, on a global basis. 50% of assets under management growth last year uh, were in China alone. Uh, and this is where investors today are looking for opportunities. So we're a bit more cautious about Europe, but we do see uh, attractive opportunities, as I mentioned, uh, for example, in the distressed sector. Uh, and also in a range of um, specific uh, sectors, uh, you know, where we think that um, corporate earnings growth is still satisfactory and that uh, uh, particularly for investors who are minded, for example, to reconfigure, recalibrate their portfolios uh, in the ESG area, Europe still offers a few good opportunities. We're also seeing a China that's dealing with, uh, after a period of unprecedented, historically unprecedented growth now, an unprecedented kind of slowdown. Some of those factors are yes. political, with the trade war still to be resolved, but some of them are undeniably structural as well. What sort of opportunities would you see in China, given the uncertain environment and the difficult, unenviable juggle that policymakers have there? Yes, that's a very good question. Uh, uh, the Chinese economy today uh, is um, an interesting economy. They're, they're effectively at a crossroads. Historically, China has been focused on investment, on savings. Today, there is an important recalibration happening in China. Recalibration towards the consumer economy, recalibration towards an expansion of capital markets. Uh, you might have noticed that a couple of years ago, uh, what was perceived as um, somewhat of a crackdown on, on uh, shadow banking, for example, uh, has been loosened, uh, and that the regulatory and fiscal environment is becoming far more supportive. We think China is in the process of a recalibration towards a consumer-driven, innovation, small and mid-sized enterprise-driven economy. In effect, uh, China is uh, reconfiguring itself to look a little more like the United States, a country that will be of uh, great importance uh, to investors around the world, as well as, of course, uh, as a source of exports for manufacturers, but a company where domestic capital markets, innovation, and the conversion of innovation into new products, wealth creation, and, and good paying jobs, effectively, uh, will uh, offer great opportunities for investors. China also has um, a fast-growing uh, market, about $50 billion last year, of green debt uh, was issued uh, by China. 
uh, to fund its, the conversion of its uh, uh, mm. power industry uh, towards green energy, the conversion of its uh, infrastructure transportation industry uh, towards a greener form of, of transportation. So for those investors, and there are many around the world, who are recalibrating their own portfolios uh, towards a greater focus on ESG, particularly sustainable source of power generation. China today is a great opportunity. That requires, of course, local presence, uh, keen understanding of the market, uh, investment savvy, if I can describe it this way. Uh, but this is a particular area yeah. of interest. I think for global interest, yeah, uh, for, for global of, investors, and one area where we're very active at the moment. Xavier, just very quickly, I want to get That's your correct. thoughts on the hot uh, topic of the day, which of is course, the yield conversion. Knowledge of domestic markets. Absolutely. I want to get your uh, quick view on sorry, the yield which inversion, is which is obviously the hot markets topic of the day. The yield inversion in the U.S. We've also seen the capitulation when it comes to benchmark yields everywhere from New Zealand Correct. to Australia yes. this morning, falling to a, a, a yes. record low. Uh, I'm just going to bring up this GTV chart as well, showing when we've seen recessions tracking that same phenomenon in 2001 and, of course, 2008 to 2009. Do you still see this as being essentially a forward indicator of more doom and gloom in the global economy to come? Well, we're not quite that uh, gloomy. In fact, we're rather more sanguine uh, about uh, prospects for the global e economy. Uh, there's definitely some slowdown. Some, of course, uh, comes on the back of technical factors in the United States. The impact, for example, of the government shutdown is, is starting to be, uh, make itself felt through, through economic statistics. But we think uh, uh, the flattening of the curve, and there's no doubt that uh, if you look at statistics going back to the 1960s, Every significant flattening of the curve in the United States has been uh, has marked the, the prelude to a significant economic uh, slowdown and in some cases recession. But we're a little bit optimistic. We, we consider that these uh, conditions at the moment are rather technical. Uh, we think they're linked in part to Treasury issuance, particularly on the short end of the curve. Uh, the Fed's balance sheet is essentially uh, of a longer duration. Uh, so we think there are some technical consideration at the moment that are um, mm. uh, impacting uh, the shape of the curve. We think these are temporary condition. We do believe that the credit right. cycle has a few more years to go. If you look, for example, at default rate in the United States, uh, they remain very much on the low side, on the low end, in the region of two and a half to three and a yeah. half percent. When you compare to you know 2008, 2009, where where default rates. Uh, you know, hit almost hit 15 percent. Now, one needs to be careful and selective. Some sectors, like like media, retail, utilities, have been somewhat more impacted uh, than others. 